Hey guys, welcome to my channel. Today I will be doing my top 10 books of 2018. I got some tea, not gossipy tea, just regular tea. I feel like we have to preface that now. And my top 10 books. So let's get into it. In the number 10 spot, I have Kamikaze Girls by Novala Takemoto. This is a story about two girls, two young girls in rural Japan. First we have Momoko who identifies as a Lolita. These are young girls in Japan who dress in the French Rococo era, um, 18th century fashion pretty much. And this is used to identify or express themselves in that way. We also have Ichigo who dresses and expresses herself as a Yankee. This is a type of girl who dresses in kind of a biker gang fashion. They're very um, masculine, very dark colors, and Momoko, obviously in the Lolita fashion, is very pastel colors. And so they are complete opposites, and they meet by chance. Uh, Ichigo almost hits Momoko on her motorcycle, and so the two girls find themselves in like this kind of Romeo and Juliet sort of friendship. And I gave this five stars. I thought the writing was really beautiful, but what I really appreciated in this novel is the message of friendship. And the friendship that develops between Momoko and Ichigo is wonderful. It had me smiling from page one. There are so many quotes in here that I underlined because I just think of them as like the cutest friends like Momoko really wants to bring Ichigo out of her shell and kind of make her this confident girl and Ichigo doesn't understand how Momoko can dress in this kind of Lolita fashion and have everybody stare at her and still not be afraid to be who she is and they grow so much over the book it's not even long the book is only 200 pages but they grow so much and they become kind of like the best of friends and I just think it's like the most beautiful friendship. And there's also a movie and I was meaning to watch this movie because I really enjoyed it and I saw some clips from it and I just thought it was so funny. So I'm excited to watch this movie and I definitely recommend this one if you love a slow burn type of friendship where the two characters grow due to one another. In at the number 9 spot is Golden Sun by Pierce Brown. If you watch my December wrap up then you know that I had finished Morningstar in December but I read the entire trilogy in 2018. So I had to pick um, from that trilogy which one was the best because I think I would give it a solid 4.5 stars overall. And I decided to go with Golden Sun which is the middle book. Basically if you don't know Red Rising is a trilogy well, the first trilogy basically is about this boy named Darrow who grows up in the Reds of society and the Reds believe that they are building this new society on Mars and what they don't know is that there's a whole color system of humans, golds at the top and the golds have been living this ideal life on the backs of these other colors for years. Darrow the way he grows in the first novel is amazing. He goes from this like really young red um, who doesn't know life beyond the walls and life beyond his simple marriage with his sweetheart and he grows into this powerful gold who rises into society and this one is basically about Darrow being risen in the golden society and how they put him on this pedestal and he uses that to his advantage to free his enslaved people, I guess. It's hard to get into what this novel is about without spoiling Red Rising, but it is really good. I think Pierce Brown's writing is fantastic. I think the first novel is a bit hard to understand with the terminology that he uses, but I think once you're in it, you understand like what's going on and the terms that they use. And I think this one was really brilliant. I really liked where the characters went in this one they took a lot of risks and the payoff was amazing but they also suffered and I think Pierce Brown does this excellent job of putting characters on pedestals and then ripping the pedestal from under them and them learning and growing from it and getting better and with each book you see them learn their lessons and make mistakes and I think in this one Darrow made a lot of mistakes that really twist his perception in Morningstar and I think what happens in here made for a really good ending and I think that this one was the most solid and that's why this one made my list. Coming in in the number eight spot we have We Are the Ants by Sean David Hutchinson. This is the story of Henry Denton and how he is faced with the task 
of being abducted by aliens and them providing him with this ultimatum of figuring out if the earth is worth it and if humanity is worth it and he can press the button to destroy the earth or he can't and it's a give or take. I thought that this book was beautiful, harrowing, an interesting look at depression in young adults. It was fascinating. Uh, I really, really enjoyed the message. This is my first Sean David Hutchinson and I understand why he's such a renowned author in the young adult contemporary spectrum because I think he does a good job of blending the contemporary world with this kind of like fabulism, magical realism, science-y. In this case it's kind of like a science-y fiction with the aliens and I just thought that the way he tied those two together added more depth to the story because I think having this for real ultimatum about whether about this young child with depression deciding if the world is worth it is really meaningful and it's, over the course of the story you see him like figure out whether or not he thinks it's important there's like little inserts here and there of chapters of like what's going wrong in the world there's one chapter about bees that i thought was really interesting because i feel like a lot of things people don't care about and they don't realize what we are doing to the planet and humanity as a whole does sound shitty and if you're looking at it from the perspective of whether or not it is shitty and whether or not it needs to end right now i don't I don't fault Henry in thinking that it's not worth it. And so the book kind of ends and you're left wondering yourself if the world is worth it or not. So I thought that that was really well done on uh, Sean David Hutchinson's part. And it's brilliant. I think this is one of the best young adult novels that I read this year. Coming in at the number seven spot we have The Marrow Thieves by Sherry Demeline. This is set in a dystopian Canada where white people have lost the ability to dream and the um, Native Americans have not lost this ability. So the white government believes that the cure for dreaming is within the bone marrow of Native Americans and so Native Americans are being hunted. This was a beautiful novel that reigns so closely to the current climate in Canada. This is so much more than a typical piece of YA literary dystopia. It is an indigenous narrative that examines the loss of a culture and the loss of a people and the need to keep both of those things alive. It is a powerful and painful book that offers teachings to um, indigenous communities today and to Canadians in general. And this novel didn't end in a happy note it just ended in kind of a realistic note it was just amazing and I, and so brilliant and it was put in such a small amount of pages again this is a book that is 200 pages but it is packed with meaningful writing and meaningful messages that just pull at you and make you think and this novel really made me think I think it was just beautiful and if you have access to this novel I think it is well worth the read this was absolutely amazing. I tabbed up every possible page that I could because I just thought that it was brilliant and this really set the bar for dystopian novels because I think dystopia as a genre can do so much and this novel did so much for me. Coming in at the number six spot we have Blue Lily Lily Blue and The Raven King. I finished The Raven Cycle this year with these two novels. So basically The Raven Cycle follows a group of four boys and one girl, so Blue, Gansey, Ronan, Adam, and Noah. And basically they are on the hunt for the this Welsh king who is dead in between these ley lines um, in the North Virginia area and they have to find him to save Gansey from dying. It's really mystical, it's really retrospective very meta on the YA genre. I think it was fascinating. I think Maggie Steve Otter's writing is so whimsical and, and if I could have the capability to write the way she writes I would be incredibly happy. Blue Lily Lily Blue really amped up the stakes for the novel. Um, there's a lot of things that go on in here that changed the way you perceive the world and I think The Raven King really added to that kind of change in the world. Like this novel is very different from the other novels in the series and I think that could be 
very polarizing and I think that that's why this novel either you love it or you don't and I really loved it. I think it really amped up the game. I think a lot of things happened. The end of this book also has the short story Opal which is Adam and Ronan after the events of these series and it was told through such an innocent perspective and I really enjoyed that. I think Steve Otter did an excellent job with ending the quartet with these two novels and I can't, like with Golden Sun, I can't really get in depth into the plot because they are the finales, but I just thought that they were brilliant. I think Maggie Stewarder is a brilliant writer and I think this series overall is excellent if you love young adult magical realism because it follows a found family and I just think that it is so magical and I love it for those reasons. In the number five spot we have The Mistborn Trilogy by Brandon Satterson, particularly the Well of Ascension and the Hero of Ages, which I read this year. Brandon Sanderson really upped the game of what I expect fantasy novels to be. I think he really goes in depth in his characters and really makes you care for the characters with every book. You're going into little details every five seconds and you might and it is so slow but his writing is so captivating that you don't even realize how slow the novel is. You're becoming really invested in characters and you're really rooting for characters and then something doesn't go right. And then you have the next book where you're really invested into new characters but you're still becoming invested in these old characters that were in the back of your mind and you're growing and you're growing and you're growing and you're caring for them and then he completely shifts the narrative. It's, it's insane. I think he is one of the most skillful writers, I think, of our time. I think what he does with the fantasy genre is absolutely amazing. I didn't even tell you what these books were about. I just went into how great I think he is. But basically, this novel follows what would happen after kind of the villain wins and what you do when you are tasked with this revolutionary ideology and how you want to defeat the bad guy. So I just think these stories are so good. I think Brandon Sanderson does an interesting thing with religion in these novels. I love the concept of religion in fantasy worlds and I think he in particular did a really excellent job and I wasn't expecting to love this as much as I did but when I picked these up I realized why they are so heavily regarded in the fantasy world like no matter where I go to look at books if I'm in the fantasy section people are always like have you read Mistborn and now I can finally say yes and I'm debating rereading these this year because I just think that they're so good and I really want to read them back to back I don't know we'll see maybe but pick these up if you haven't. I swear to god they are totally worth it if you love fantasy. In the fourth spot we have The Tiger's Daughter by Kay Arsenal Rivera. This is a epistolary novel of one woman telling a story to her lover and the story of them and how they got together but at the same time it's kind of like this Game of Thrones thing where you're being distracted by this love story when you know that there's this impending doom that looms over them and you're distracted by them reuniting at the end and I just if you watch my reading vlog during when I read this novel you would know how brilliant I thought it was I think Rivera's writing is really engaging and captivating and if you're following along with this video you'll notice that that is something that I really value in all my favorite books and I just think that the love story that she weaves in this novel is amazing and and loving and inspirational and I think the ends that they go to to be together is beautiful but at the same time I know that there's this impending thing in the background because she's throwing in little shots about problems that they're having but you're being distracted by this beautiful love story and I thought that that was done really brilliantly because I was heavily distracted and it's only until I finished this novel that I realized what a brilliant thing she did I love the concept of epistolary novels and this idea of women talking to women through this overarching idea because when women started writing novels a lot of them were epistolary, a lot of them were these memoirs collected by these women but written by women as this collection. It, it's a fascinating time in Victorian literature when you realize how heavily the epistolary novel shaped the way 
women's writing is today and I think when women go into this aspect again it is very interesting and I love thinking about that and I love watching this kind of genre grow over time and I just really love this and it was beautiful and I bought the second installment and I can't wait to see where this goes because I thought this was fucking brilliant. In third spot we have A Conjuring of Light by V.E. Schwab. This one's no surprise, this is my favorite series. I read this novel twice this year. Basically, if you don't know what a Darker Shade of Magic series is about, it is about Kel, who he is able, as an Antari, to travel between four different Londons. And that's how the novel starts, but it becomes so much more. It becomes this war with one of the versions of London, but it's not really. And I think the first two novels, while I gave them five stars, because I think on their own, they are brilliant and they are fun stories. This one really brought everything together and was a really hard book to read. There were a lot of stakes that went down in this novel and a lot of things that happened and there were consequences and there were deaths and there were feelings that occurred. There was love, there was romance, there was friendship. I just thought that this novel encapsulated everything that I love in fantasy and I love what the fantasy genre can bring forth and I just think that V.E. Schwab as a writer is very talented because she's able to keep you constantly engaged with every page you are realizing how heavy the stakes are and how everything is happening and how everything is tying together and I think that that is part of her talent and what makes her such a brilliant writer and so this is my favorite series. I don't really, I don't think I can talk about how I love it objectively without having this pull at my heart because I just adore this series and I reread it twice already and I just think it is magical and wonderful and genuinely it's fun. And I think that if you love those things, you will love this. Okay, we are getting to the end. In second place, we have Black Iris by Elliot Wake. Um, this was written before he changed his name. This is a story about a girl named Lainey and her relationship with two people, Armin and Blythe, and how this relationship comes to be, how this relationship affects her life, and how this relationship already affected her life. It, this story took turns, man, and it was there were moments that I wasn't expecting scenes like I thought this novel was going someplace and then Wake was like nope it's not it's going this way and you're just gonna follow along and then you're like okay I get this I think it's going this way and they're like nope no it's not and it was just so fucked up this novel is so fucked up because it just throws all kinds of things at you and it is dark and it is grim and I think there's so much happening that's incredibly engaging and it is so fast-paced and everything is on the line and everything is happening and you realize how fucked up these characters are and that you've been rooting for people who are so incredibly fucked up and I think that that is what made this novel brilliant to me and I think that that's why it made the top because it surprised me so heavily. I went into this thinking that it was going to be like a standard thriller, a standard romance thriller, being that it is in the new adult genre, but it was so much more than that and I really commend Elliot Wake for the brilliance that he put into a new adult novel because I feel like new adult gets this rap for being romance and smutty and I think he did so much more with this book and that's why I commend him for such a brilliant job. And last, my favorite book of the year I think comes as a surprise to people who know what I like and know that I like fantasy and to myself because I also know that I like fantasy and I'm surprised that my number one book of the year isn't a fantasy but it is Night Film by Marisha Pessel. This is so hard to explain. On a surface level this is a novel about a reporter who investigates the suicide of a daughter of a recluse indie dark director and what comes about this investigation. And that is so surface level of a synopsis, but I think just knowing that and going into the novel 
you realize the twists and turns and layers that Marisha Pestle adds to this novel and you're reading it and you're constantly being surprised and you're constantly thrown with facts. She puts in a bunch of these things that lead you astray and you think, is it that? Is that the reason this is happening? Or is it that? Is that the reason this is happening? And you're constantly going back and forth and you can't grasp what is happening until the end and I, it was so brilliant it it's more than a thriller it's more than a horror uh, a horror novel like I would be sitting up late at night reading this and having to put it down because I was so scared I think Puzzle's writing is really an testament to this she is capable of writing a funny character she is capable of writing a mystifying character she's capable of writing spooky characters and they're all all of these things each character has a different element of her capability and it's incredible to me how long I went without reading this novel because I think that she really amps up the game of thrillers for me. I think this novel is fantastic and that's why it's my number one of the year. I can't imagine while all these books being amazing in their own way, Night Film really hit the bar running. She came and she went and she left me in a state of shock and I, I told everybody about this book after I was done reading it because I was just like this book is freaking amazing and I can't believe more people haven't read this book. I can't believe this book doesn't have awards. I think it is fucking fantastic. It is so good and if you haven't read this book please pick it up. It's not a fantasy. It is just a brilliant, brilliantly written book that really engages with all elements of fiction and I think that that is why it is my number one of the year. So those were my top 10 books of the year. If you read any of them, please let me know down below. Let me know what you thought, even if you thought they sucked. Let me know. I really genuinely want to know all of your thoughts down below. Give this video a like. Give it a dislike. Give me an argument in the comments because I love to debate and next time I'm probably going to film my least favorite books of the year and I don't know how to end my videos so all I'll say is bye, have a good day.